Most recently, I've been leaving little, little breadcrumbs all over my Instagram, and I've been doing so whilst I've been using RX Audio Editor for more advanced mastering applications. And in the process, I've had several engineers and producers hit me up for one-on-ones. They want to get an idea of what my workflow is, any little tips or tricks. And I respect that because nothing would make me more excited to get on calls with some of these people because I respect them a lot. But I figured a call will only take it so far. I'd rather plan out something where I can present you with super accurate information in a well-structured way. I feel more confident doing it here on YouTube. And then if these people want to hit me up for a chat on the phone or jump on a Zoom call, more than happy to do so. Now, I'm going to be honest, this is a critical part of my workflow as it's these preliminary steps in auditioning, analyzing, preparing material that give me the flexibility to do what I want to when I'm mastering a record with less of, oh, I need to be careful of this, or I'm a bit compromised because of this particular element. I can sort of get a heads up ahead of coming into the session and fix little things um, where necessary. So that way I'm getting the most out of the audio and the fidelity of that mix. Now, more objectively, what does that mean? Well, there are three key elements of a mix which strongly affects my processing decisions in my mastering chain. And they are the dynamics or crest factor of the material, the low end balance of the material, and whenever there are any excessive sibilance in the material. Those three objective pain points for me as a mastering engineer are also pain points for mixing engineers in terms of it's something common that they try to deal with or try to improve on in their mixes. So more often than not before mastering, I'm actually using Isotope RX not to necessarily prep the mixes, but just surface a detailed analysis and give feedback to my clients ahead of amending the mixes. That said, even if I'm giving people mixed feedback and I'm still getting a new mix in that might be corrected, it's always worth the extra effort to give it a once over, just double check and do any final tweaks that you might need to that will help you get that last two to 3% out of your mastering process. Firstly, let's address the elephant in the room, loudness. People want loud masters. And it's a common pain point for me as a mastering engineer when the crest factor of a mix is too large and the microdynamics and there's little peaks all over the space um, that really limits what I can do in order to achieve a competitive master without compromising certain details. So managing the crest factor and the peak values is something I've spoken about before in this channel. And it's also the very, very first thing I do in preparing all my mixes, which come to the studio. That said, even though I've shown you before, I'll show you again exactly how I go about this. Now, to get your crest factor, it's as simple as going into Isotope Audio Editor, clicking on the waveform stats, then it'll generate waveform stats, finding the loudest true peak of your mix, and then also calculating different loudness measurements. And what you want to do is you want to get your loudest true peak and subtract that from your integrated loudness. Now, typically the best mixes I'm receiving for, for mastering a within 10 to 14 of a crest factor. And this is a good starting point because it doesn't mean I need to over process in compression, over clip or over limit anything. It's just a good ballpark to start with in terms of overall details and management of the mix. Now, this one we have here is 16.2, a true peak level of 0.2. 2, positive 0.2, so it's actually going over 0, and an integrated readout of 16, which is 6.2. Now, how do we manage this? So there's a few things we could do in this circumstance. We could, in mastering, clip the loudest peaks. And the thing with clipping or hard clipping is that it just squares off the waveform, just flat, square, that causes harmonic distortion. Now, in some circumstances where we want that more edgy, aggressive tone, that can work well. But for the most part, it does compromise the fidelity of the audio. And before you even start processing anything to just know that you're going to be clipping the signal and limiting yourself to that process in order to bring those peaks down is, is not the best. Um, let's look at the second option. The second option would be to limit. Okay, to use a limiter, which is a time-bound dynamics processor in terms of the way it releases um, and operates within a signal, because basically a signal comes in when it goes over the threshold, a gain stage circuit limits the signal, and then it releases back to unity. Um, so it's subject to time-bound issues, which could be pumping on the release. And again, sometimes you want to push and drive a limiter. There's a certain sound to that, which works. However, um, 
we don't always want to do that. We want to be free in our choices when we're mastering. So what I like to do is, and I've shown it before on the channel, we take this slider and move it all the way left. So we only have the waveform. Now what we can see is probably a dozen or so stray peaks here. All we need to do is click on the true peak here. Okay. We zoom in. Zoom in all the way. That's on the right hand channel. Whoops, a bit too far. Where are we? 0.2. There we go. So that peak right there. See that peak there? We're going to just change this tool to this way here. So we can zoom in nice, nice and close to this waveform. Beautiful. Okay, that's what we got there. That means that we've got a little, we've got some peaks over here on the right hand channel. If we get the gain tool, we can simply just clip gain those. There's probably about 20 samples there. That is so fast. You would never even hear this and just render it down negative two decibels. Okay. And now your peak on that channel has given you an extra two decibels of crest factor headroom. And basically what you do is allow it to recalculate every time then go to the next true peak. So that was at positive two, the next true peak, I'm not sure where it's gonna be, uh, negative plus 0.03, you go there, and this one is actually being clipped. Um, that's actually well over zero. But again, we just go through each one and bring it down, something like that, when you observe that there's hard clipping, because it's going over zero, then you can use a D clipper um, plugin, which is, only on that specific section so you don't get artifacts elsewhere because the threshold is getting a little bit funny. But that's how I manage to get my crest factor down. And, and I'll show you an example of what this looks like before and after. I've pulled out the before and the after version and it's bought me an extra two decibels of headroom. And it's just simply these little peaks here. So if I go like this, you can see these three peaks, three or four peaks on this right hand side, which were giving me readouts very high that I would have ended up going over zero clipping. One was actually already clipping and, and I've dealt with that. And this is after. So that is the first sort of pain point I deal with in RX Audio Editor. This takes me about 10 or so minutes, depending. Sometimes it takes me two minutes, sometimes it takes me 15 minutes, but it's a short amount of time to set your mix up for success in mastering. And I've spoken about the alternatives. The alternatives do have compromise, um, whereas this is a good way when your crest factor is quite large to manage these little microdynamic details. The second most important aspect of my mastering workflow in Isotope RX Audio Editor is making sure my low end is in check. Now, if I drag this left to right, I can get the FFT spectrogram, which is the Fast Fourier Transform Spectrogram. Now that is very important because there's some settings we're going to dial in here with specifically for working with low end. So if we go into view and spectrogram settings, these are the default settings you're given. Now the auto adjustable STFT format is pretty good. It's actually pretty accurate. However, I like to go adaptively sparse because I like to push my CPU and see how far I can really grind out numbers. Basically what it's doing is it's just giving me more better resolution and accuracy with both my time and frequency information. Time being left to right and frequency being bottom to top or top to bottom, whichever way you look at it. Now, the next thing you want to look at is the FFT size. Now, the FFT size dictates the selected number of samples, which each time bound block length is calculated from. Your options here are all to the power of two. And we'll give you an example, two to the power of 10 being 1024 samples. Now, in layman's terms, what does that mean? Well, basically, the smaller the FFT size, the more transient or time bound information you're going to get because it's going to be calculating every 256 samples. The larger that block size is, the more frequency resolution you're going to get at the sacrifice of the transient information. Why this is important is because it dictates how clearly the spectrogram displays transient information. And when I do my low end work, um, I like to have it at 1024. Sometimes I might step up to 2048 if I need it, but typically 1024. The next setting is the window setting, and that dictates the leakage or crossover between the FFT frequency bins. Now, regular, the rectangular, not regular, re rectangular tends to give me the best frequency resolution when I start to zoom in, which is what I like to have set for low end information because I like to distinguish various notes and fundamental bass frequencies in a mix. So that sort of offsets the transient information at 1024 and gives me a bit more better frequency resolution across the board. Now, 
at the moment, things look a bit confusing because it's just a bunch of these lights. Like, what is this, this gradient that's going on here? Well, things are going to start to go a little bit crazy now because the final and most important setting for all of this is using the extended log setting. Now, I'm going to show you why. Extended log for the frequency scale plots frequencies using a logarithmic scale down to 10 hertz. So if we look at the linear mode, all the frequencies are represented 0 to 20 kilohertz all the way up, evenly, evenly spread. Extended log creates that logarithm from 10 hertz and favors better resolution in the low end. Now let's get practical with this. We've got this tune Daniel Tonic on my skin. And what we're going to do is I'm going to do some spectral editing. Then we're going to save these spectral edits, go to Pro Tools and have a listen to what I've done. Let's start converting this information that we see visually into something practical we can use. So the first thing is this amplitude range, low and high, I like to treat like a visual threshold for what is the most loudest information and to get rid of all the low level information. So using this amplitude range, low slider, I can slide this up and it's going to get rid of all the low level information, which I don't actually really need to see for the sake of working on the low end. So that got rid of a lot of it. And I can see there's a lot of energy down below a hundred Hertz, but what does that really actually mean? Let's actually get some, some things on the ground here. So let's zoom in. And as we zoom in, we're going to see a little bit more here. Wow. We've zoomed in and we can see quite a bit. Now we've zoomed in, we can actually get a little bit of information out of this. So what's happening. We've got this baseline underneath it around here. And that I know is a baseline. It's not sustaining the kick. Um, between that subline is around 37, 37 to 65 hertz. And that's pretty cool. So we know that if we want to get more punch out of the kick, if we boost anything there, we're also going to be boosting the bass. However, between those harmonics, those odd order harmonics and the fundamental, the bass line, we actually have quite a bit of information there, which just is mainly kick. So it's just the punch of that kick. So, and that is actually between 63 hertz and 153 hertz. That's where a lot of that smack, that punch that's hitting people in the chest. It's not necessarily the low sub, but it's just coming out of the speaker a little bit more there. And it's got a lot of room around it not to get interrupted, so to speak. So what we can do is we can go back to using this gain function that we used for the microdynamic detail and do a boost here. And I'm going to be pretty liberal with the boost just for the sake of this example, but let's boost and highlight that section and boost those frequencies by three decibels. That's going to boost all those frequencies. And then we'll see on the FFT, we'll see those frequencies light up a little bit harder, which is really cool. I think there's some sort of harmonics that have come out from the bass a little bit, but those fundamentals re remain relatively unscathed. And for the purpose of this exercise in showing you guys how this can sound, this is going to be a lot of fun. So what we've been able to do is by using extended log, we get better resolution in the low end. We can delineate the difference between what is part of the bass line and what is part of the kick drum and where the, those harmonics are for the bass line above that as well. Um, simply by moving this threshold and using the extended log scale, then we can highlight where there's a gap in the kick drum and boost it. Now, conversely, if a bass line is too loud or a fundamental of a kick is too loud, I can do the inverse of this and use a gain scale as negative three, and that will attenuate frequencies which are too loud in the low end. But basically this gives me a visual representation of that information. And when I audition it and listen to it, I can make a assess assessments as to whether I need to get a little bit more kick or pull it back a little bit or a little bit more bass or pull it back a little bit. Or if there's a particular note that's in or out, I can visually see this represented early on rather than trying to sweep with it with an EQ and not sort of knowing in a time bound fashion, if that's the best, best way of approaching it. So that is with low end. And what I'm going to do is for this exercise is save this as, and I'm going to call this big bass because that's typically what I call whenever I do a big bass on isotope audio editor and basically big kick actually it should be, but let's head over to pro tools because this is where we're going to pull this mix in. We're going to pull this mix in and have a little tinker with it. So big bass and the normal one, and let's actually have a listen to this kick drum and see how it sort of plays out, how it pulls in um, a little bit more punch. 
And I'm hoping we got this right because it'd be a bit embarrassing if I didn't, but I think we're pretty much on the money. Now let's A, B. Now remember, I did a three decibel boost at that particular frequency we were able to observe in Isotope Audio Editor. So that three decibel boost between about 60 and 150 hertz, we can observe that there's clear way for us to do that without affecting the baseline or other elements. Um, three decibels is a lot, okay? So this is gonna sound blown out. However, you're gonna hear how the baseline sits in the same place, but the kick drum just completely comes out at those frequencies and hits you a little bit harder. Um, not a little bit, it actually hits you quite a lot harder, but uh, let's enjoy having a listen to this for the sake of this exercise anyway. Now, the final aspect I like to deal with inside Audio Editor is any excessive sibilance. Now, rather than leaning heavily on dynamic processes for DSing, I like to go into Audio Editor because often there's only maybe a dozen, 18, maybe two dozen points where there's excessive sibilance that you really need to deal with. And having a dynamics processor and automating all those points in, it just seems a bit you know, slap and go. I like to use Audio Editor to deal with sibilance too, and I'm going to give credit where credit's due because this is one of the techniques Jonathan Weiner showed at um, NAM, and I've pulled it into my own process as well. Now, let me show you the settings. They're a little bit different in the spectrogram settings. So I like to use the MAL scale because it gives me a little bit more fidelity or resolution in that sibilance range between two to five kilohertz and a little bit higher. I keep the window rectangular because I want accuracy in my frequency resolution or accuracy, but then I do extend the FFT size typically to 20 48, um, as it has a bit more frequency detail and I don't really need the transient information as much anymore because I'm not dealing with a percussive element. Now there's a section in this song in this break where where it gets a little bit bitey, okay? So same way we did with the low end, we're gonna go into this section here, zoom in, and we're gonna use the frequency slider just to give us a little bit more assessment of what's actually going on here because it gets it gets pretty bitey on some of these phrases. And I might head over into Pro Tools so we can hear those phrases before I edit them out, and then we can audition it and A, B it. Now, Using this FFT slide, I'm just going to pull it back a little bit more, and there I can see it. Now, what I'm seeing and what I'm saying I'm seeing are these frequencies here, where those lines are a little bit brighter. Just zooming in here for you. We can see those orange vertical lines that are a bit brighter, and those are very harsh sibilances from this particular vocal. Now, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to audition it at 4.06 was the sibilance I was going to show you and showcase to you because it was quite harsh. Um, so that's 4.06 and we'll head over into Pro Tools and audition that part of the audio. Remember when you try to care. You can hear that. Remember when you ch that try to care. That ch is so hard. Remember when you try to care. And it's not just one singular frequency, it's a range of frequencies, which tends to be the case, especially with sibilance, because it's quite a texture. There's a lot of air moving, um, and it can cross over actually one or two octaves at times. Now, this particular one sits somewhere between 7, 7 and 3.2 kilohertz. And the reason why I'm actually able to pinpoint this is because I've left out some critical information for you. Whenever you highlight frequency bound information, in the bottom right hand corner, it gives you your lower and higher thresholds as well as the range of frequencies that you're highlighting. I thought that'd be quite an important thing to note out and I left it out. I don't know why, sorry for that. So basically that is where that ch, that ch, that change voice is coming in. I bring the threshold down a little bit more so it can visually be a little bit more brighter there for us to see. And we can see it just coming through there pretty harshly. Now, what we're going to do is, again, it's just as simple as using the gain tool. I'm going to take about negative three, negative five. We'll be a bit aggressive on this because just one isolated instance. So the overall amplitude's 
the luma value or the light value of that particular section is equal to what's around it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to save this again, file, save as, and I'm going to rename this uh, for DS406. So we can audition this before and after. And again, I find this actually much more easier than dialing in a DSer because a DSer, you have to manage how it interacts with so many other elements. Whereas in audio editor, you just find it attenuate it and then move on. All right, so now I've got the DS version at the top and the original underneath it. Let's audition that edit, that spectral edit. And I'll just have it on loop and you hear the sibilance really hard the first time and the second time you hear the edited version. Remember when you try to care. 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 So negative five decibels, probably a little bit too much, but you can see how you can easily isolate individual elements and attenuate them. And again, I was a little bit extreme on these examples so you could hear it clearly, especially over YouTube. And you can just see how quick and easy it is to find information about the low end, about particular peaks, about particular sibilance visually, and then manage that ahead of jumping into mastering the record. Um, that, that's a really important part of my process. Now, with all this considered, if we head back over to Isotope Audio Editor, um, I'd like to make some honorable mentions to some additional tools which enter my workflow in this suite. Uh, the first one has to be mouth to click. Mouth D click or mouth to click, mouth D click has to be a lifesaver. It, it, it is a lifesaver. It doesn't have to be. It is that lifesaver which I am in love with because. Bad vocal editing, mouth clicks, killer recording, especially if it's a low level detail being brought out in the mastering process. Now I'll use the D crackler. Where's D crackle? There you are. I'll use this one often enough where there's little crackles in a mix where I, which aren't meant to be there that I can at attend to. Um, D clip is my friend for bad Ableton sessions or people who don't know how to gain stage. And D noise is also a really good one for intros and outros of softer intros and outros where that noise floor is, is a little bit too on set into the mix. Now, having this tool set at my fingertips at the start of each project enables me to get the most out of every bit of audio information I have when going through mastering. So I was excited to share this with you. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe and share this with others because I'm really enjoying making these videos. I want to do many, many more of them. So until next time, take care.